blown up. So, uh, so I have to record it locally, and which I will then post on the meeting page. Second uh, item is that we have to respect each other. Um, mainly, uh, you know, you can, of course, uh, differ in opinion from Franklin, but you have to be nice when you voice your disagreements. And it has to be rational, not just I feel. <laughs> I feel like this is not the case. You know, that's that doesn't cut it. So rationality and respect, we ask of everybody. That's it. And without waiting too long, I'm going to just have Franklin's uh, go, but I'm going to share the screen. So I will mute myself unless I have to. Yeah, when when I'm done with the presentation, just drop it and come back on and we'll do Q&A. There we go. <clears throat> all right. I think we're finally moving now after all our technical issues. And good morning, everyone. I'm Franklin Knoll. I'm a lead payment specialist here at the Federal Reserve Bank of Kansas City. Um, before that, I spent uh, 20 years running my own business out of Washington, D.C., working with the U.S. Treasury, U.S. Bureau of Engraving and Printing. And I need to note in the little box, these are my opinions, not necessarily those of the Federal Reserve Bank, Kansas City, or the board. All right. Next slide, Bippin. All right. Today we're talking about narratives. Now, we may be more familiar with narratives from the Bitcoin world. Uh, Bitcoin, Bitcoin is basically run by narratives. Of course, the original narrative was, you know, Bitcoin was going to be this new uh, censorship resistant means of payment. Then it morphed into digital gold. And now it's some kind of new asset class uh, of some sort. Well, I think the same thing kind of happened with stable coins, at least in the U.S. government. And that's where it really counts, at least for, for me and uh, for policymakers. So st stable coins have narratives, too. Uh, next slide. Oh, went too far. There you go. So I see three narratives that have played out over the past five years. Um, the first one was this idea of shadow money, which I'll get to each of these in, in turn. Then it morphed into wildcat money. Stable coins are wildcat money. And now stable coins are future money or the money of the future. And let's start with shadow money. Next slide. Okay. So all this started at least for the U.S. government with Libra. Um, I know it's five years ago, but remember way back when, when uh, Facebook or Meta wanted to introduce this new global stablecoin. And if you can remember back then, you know, the idea was the stablecoin would be backed by a basket of different currencies and it would be a worldwide, uh, there was a control consortium of 40 companies, including Visa and PayPal, who were in on this and setting up this new payment system based on this stablecoin. And this was released in June of 2019 is when the first white paper came out. Now, this did not go over too well, uh, especially in Congress. Um, Facebook already had a bad reputation for, for uh, uh, using people's data and causing lots of problems. 
And so the original reaction was this was a new shadow money. Uh, basically, Facebook was setting itself up as a new shadow bank. Um, you get a lot of pushback from especially the Democratic side in Congress. In the House, it was Maxine Waters. In the Senate, it was Sherrod Brown, who are both still in, in Congress right now. And you can see this little letter that on the right side that's highlighted that uh, members of the House sent to uh, Mr. Zuckerberg and this idea that there was this new financial system being built in Switzerland with this new money that would rival the U.S. dollar. And in one line, uh, Maxine Water writes, uh, this will be a new Swiss-based financial system that is too big to fail. So there's a lot of the 2008 financial crisis, a lot of that you know, rhetoric is popping up right now in uh, 2019. And way back here, way back in 2019, you know, in the early days, um, we were still talking about retail and wholesale uh, stable coins. And of course, in this talk, we're just talking about retail, something that's supposed to be used for uh, everyday transactions in some case. So the worry was we have this new shadow money and if it collapses, you know, we'll have a brand new financial crisis. Next slide. There we go. So the first idea that Congress came up with was to kill it, kill stable coins. Um, and the argument that was made, especially by Sylvia Garcia, a representative from Texas, was these stable coins are actually securities, and therefore the SEC should be regulating this. And the first idea with HR 5197 was to redefine a stable coin as a security, and therefore basically killed the whole idea. Um, the angle they took was it was a managed stable coin because they were managing this basket of currencies and they could um, basically operate this thing as a mutual fund, was my guess. Um, it's not always that clear. But the idea is that um, that comes out in, in this bill is that the value of the stablecoin is not pegged to a specific fiat currency. Uh, and the, the assets are managed. It's, it's a global thing. And these uh, stablecoins can be uh, redeemable in various guises, not just a USD or something like that. And Li Libra took this threat and basically they redid Libra, Libra 2.0, which came out, I think, in June 2020. And there they broke it down to they would have multiple stable coins and each would be pegged to a specific fiat. And therefore, they hope to get around this idea of um, their stable coin as a security. Um, but pretty much by the end of 2020, um, the whole idea was dead. So uh, even when they changed their name to DM, it didn't help all that much. So let's go to the next slide. So basically, that was the shadow money narrative that popped up uh, in the early days. Uh, stable coins were seen as global. They're a threat to the US dollar, to the US economy. Their value is not pegged to a specific fiat currency. They're basically securities in some way. Um, they're redeemable for various kinds of assets. And basically, uh, Congress saw stablecoin issuers as shadow banks, which brought up all the 2008 fears. Um, they're just a threat to the world order and economy. Um, there didn't seem, at least from what I can see, a really deep understanding uh, in Congress of what stablecoins actually were. There was this like gut reaction to the idea that, you know, there's this shadowy, unknown, scary thing out there, um, and we just need to kill it. 
Now, as 2020 expired or late in 2020 into 2021, things start to shift. Um, Diem basically starts to disappear and that fear of this global currency disappears. And Brian Brooks over at the OCC started issuing these letters um, that were pro stablecoin. Um, in September, he puts out an interpretive letter which says national banks can hold reserves for stablecoin issuers. Um, then in January, he puts, puts out one says stablecoins can be part of an INVN, which I wrote down is an independent node verification network. Basically, he's saying stablecoins can run on regular payment rails. He says they're no different than traveler's checks. So we're starting to see this idea starting to morph. Let's go to the next slide. And this is when the idea of wildcat money starts bubbling up. Um, there's new, this new conception. Uh, people are relating stable coins to the free banking era in the United States. And they talk about the wild west of crypto and all that. And I weighed in on this and helped the, the narrative along. Pictured is uh, one of my articles, Wildcat Currencies. And next to that is uh, a, a $3 note from uh, an old collapsed uh, Wildcat Bank. So just for those who might need a refresher, the free banking era was a time in the United States before the Civil War when individuals could set up banks with a state license. Um, they had to deposit usually state bonds with the treasurer of the state and that they would be allowed to set up a bank and issue currency that way. So you have all these different banks issuing their own private currencies um, all over the country and all the banks have different strengths. Some are very secure, some are not. So the value of all these notes fluctuates against each other. And what was brought up was wildcat banks. Wildcat banks were uh, usually fly-by-night operations. They would set up in the middle of nowhere with a state charter, uh, issue as much money as they could, um, make their profit, and then just disappear. Um, they're called wildcat banks from some idea that in Michigan, it's from Michigan, that banks were only set up where wildcats roam. That's, that's where this gets to. Um, and also what pops up during this time was this article by uh, uh, Gorton and Zhang in 2021 called Taming Wildcat Stablecoins. And this made a big uh, splash, though I totally disagree with most of what's in the article. Um, they come up with this NQA principle, which is no questions asked principle, which they just made up. Um, and I don't know where it comes from. But basically, all this is getting around the idea that all these different stable coins, like all the different uh, notes in the free banking area would have different values, depending on the strength of the bank, where the bank is located, how easy redemption is, things like that. So we're coming up against the singleness of money idea. And that's kind of what's going on with the NQA principle. So what Congress starts to think is we have to regulate these things. We don't have to kill stable coins because now all the ideas are they're pegged to the US dollar and they would be kind of either issued in the United States or controlled from the United States. So the debate is really about how to fine tune stable coins now and tame the wild west, uh, one could argue. It's not shadow money anymore. It's now something different. Let's go to the next slide. And the model for this is um, HR 8827 put out by Talib Lynch and Garcia in the House, all Democrats. And this was originally put out as the Stable Act, Stablecoin Tethering and Bank Licensing Enforcement Act. Um, 
and this comes out after Diem is already dead. And now that looks like the new target is Tether, um, which is totally out of control and I think still is. But now they're redefining what a stable coin is. It's, it's, it's issued in the US, it's pegged to the dollar, and the way to solve the problem is basically do what Congress Congress did at the, at the time of the Civil War, take all these fragmented banks and make a national banking system. So the idea is all these stablecoin issuers will now be pseudo banks or at least FDIC insured or have some kind of bank charter. So now we're taming wildcat money. What's going on? Let's go to the next slide. So here's the wildcat money narrative. Um, stable coins are, you know, out of control, but, you know, we can find a way to regulate them to get them under control. Stable coins are not shadow global money anymore. They're a domestic issue. Um, and they're pegged to the US, USD, not to this basket of different crypto assets and different currencies, things like that. And we can, Congress says, we can fix this if they all just become banks. And that'll solve the problem. So ultimately, like I say here, stable coins are a US problem for Congress to solve. So let's go to the next slide. Checking my time. So in 2021, late 2021, suddenly stable coins become something different. They become this new future money. Um, and this all stems around the idea that is brought up or stable coins are redefined as payment stable coins. And in the box, I have what that means. Uh, and the idea first comes up with the president's working group um, that reported on stable coins. This is the first time this idea or this phrase pops up, as far as I can tell, in November 2021. You know, stable value connected to a fiat currency and used as a widespread means of payment. It's a retail stable coin meant for everyday transactions. That's what they're looking at. They're not looking at a stable coin set up just to run in DeFi platforms. This is something that would be used with a wallet on a daily basis. And again, the focus is this is going to be issued in the US. It's a US thing that is now uh, going to be under control. And the idea of retail payment use, that idea was inherent in the old narrative, the Wild West narrative or the Wildcat money narrative. Um, they were really talking about something that's going to be used on a daily basis. So everything needs to be regulated. So now stablecoins have started to become respectable now. So that's interesting. Next slide. So here we go. Payment stable coins go mainstream in 2022. <clears throat> so Congress, when it starts drafting its bills, picks up this term from the president's working group and starts putting it on in all its bills. So Pat Toomey's bill um, with the really long name, um, I'm not sure what the acronym is for, for that is, but you'll see it as 5340, payment stablecoin is a digital asset, stable value, convertible into fiat, widely used as a medium of exchange, issued by a centralized entity that's not decentralized, and it doesn't pay interest, and so it's not a security, and it's, it's on a ledger of some sort, and usually they use DLT in some phrasing here. And then it gets picked up well, again by Loomis and Gillibrand. So what's interesting here is now uh, stable coins are becoming a bipartisan idea because, of course, the president's working group is from Biden. 
Democrat, Toomey is Republican, uh, Loomis is Republican, Gillibrand is Democrat. So now we're getting this bipartisan approach to this payment stablecoin, this future money. Um, and, it, and going with that, of course, Nellie Liang, who's a, a Biden Treasury Undersecretary, gives this great quote. So now stable coins, you know, they're a cornerstone of a new payment system. They're not this threat of a shadow currency or a wild west out of control thing. Now it's the cornerstone of a new payment system. Um, and again, it's pegged to the US dollar, um, a medium of exchange, redeemable on demand. And now you don't need to be a bank. The idea is you can be some kind of regulated entity and still start issuing stable coins. So things are really changing here. So let's go to the next slide. Okay. And this is last year going into this year. So, you know, payment stable coins are, you know, the bedrock of a new payment system now. There was much talk in the House, in the House Finance Committee between uh, Chair uh, Patrick McHenry and the leading opposition, Maxine Waters. They were, and I think still are, arguing over the details of stablecoin regulation. Um, Patrick Henry was able to push through a bill last summer, um, the Clarity for Payment Stablecoins Act. Again, payment stablecoins is the term we're using, and it's embedded here in H.R. 4766. Again, sta payment stablecoin, digital asset, means of payment, um, redeemable, and it's not a national currency or a security. So again, this is the culmination of over a year of talking. And Patrick McHenry has this quote when he was really pushing his bill. Um, stable coins hold the promise as a pillar of our 21st century payment system. Again, this is a big jump from Maxine Waters saying to uh, Facebook, you know, you're creating a shadow currency out of Switzerland, which will doom the, the world economy. But right now, the bill is still waiting to go to the House um, for a floor vote. Uh, the debate is over the regulatory regime. Um, what the Republicans put in in the act before was basically state control. Uh, the Democrats want the Federal Reserve to be a regulator in all stablecoin issuers. And as Bippin put out on Facebook and such, there's the new Loomis Gillibrand Payment Stablecoin Act. Again, payment stablecoin, quote unquote. Um, it, it defines a payment stablecoin almost exactly the same way as is in this box for HR 4766. They changed the regulatory, regulatory regime a bit. So the Fed now is involved with all stablecoin issuers. So this may get some traction. Um, they may be able to combine the House and Senate bills and come up with something that will actually pass this year. Um, uh, Patrick McHenry is really pushing hard for passage because he's resigning. Uh, and leaving Congress. So I think we're on to the next slide there, Vipin. <clears throat> so here's our comparative of how things have changed over the past five years. On the right is what the narrative was in 2019. On the left is the narrative in 2024. So we go from this thing that was a threat to the global economy, to the US dollar issued by shadow banks um, that's not really pegged to anything in particular other than this basket of currencies. Um, and the idea from Congress was we have to ban this thing. It, it's just a bad idea. Well, on the left, five years later, um, 
U.S.-based stablecoins are vital to U.S. competitiveness. Um, you hear that a lot in the congressional hearings. Um, uh, a USD peg stablecoin will ensure the dominance of the dollar around the world. Um, and as you saw in the quotes, stablecoins are a cornerstone or a pillar of a new payment system now. And all you need is for these entities to be regulated in, in the U.S. And, you know, the future looks bright. So last second to last slide. Let's go to the next slide. So we kind of have summed up already. As a historian, what I started looking for, so why did the narratives change? What's the causation? Um, and I'm not sure I got this nailed. Maybe somebody in the audience has a better idea of what's going on. So with shadow money, there was this you know, visceral reaction to Facebook, basically. And any idea of a stable coin that Facebook put out was, was just terrible. Um, so once that kind of dies away, you get this new um, way of looking at uh, stable coins. Now, stable coins are not anathema or something that needs to be banned immediately. It's something that has to be figured out and controlled. And that's when you start to see the OCC and Brian Brooks start saying, you know, we can work with these things. There's some value here. And then you have the Stable Act coming out and says, yes, we can regulate this in some way. Um, I don't think that there's any big crypto lobbying going on behind the scenes. Uh, crypto is only just starting to do this high powered lobbying that you would see on K Street and such. So I'm not quite sure if there's really a motor that's shifting this other than Facebook just giving up which probably helped a whole lot. Now the switch between Wildcat and future money, a lot happens. In 2021, you have the bull market and everybody's piling into crypto. You have NFTs, you have the metaverse, you have uh, Coinbase on NASDAQ. Um, you see USD peg stable coins going from 20 some billion into a hundred some billion in, in cap. Um, and then in November 2021, you have the President's Working Group come out with this idea of payment stable coins. And from then, it's almost a, a nonpartisan push to have this new monetary technology dominated by the United States and uh, pushed out by the United States to ensure uh, technological supremacy as well as supremacy of the dollar. Okay, and that's it. The last slide, Vipin, is just an image. All right, so let's have some questions and see if anybody has any other ideas about what's going on here. Or does this make sense? Does it not? I don't think we need the, the presentation anymore, Vipin. <clears throat> okay. Let me figure that one. <laughs> well, it's, you know, it's, um, I got to go back to Zoom yep. and stop the share, and there you are in full glory. <laughs> um, uh, Alfonso says, uh, how do the changes in narratives relate to the surge of CBDCs? Mm, that's interesting because... Like in November, late 2021, when the stablecoin thing comes out, not long after that, a report comes out from the White House that's really pushing CBDC strongly. They've backpedaled from that a whole lot. But at that time, it was a lot of research was going to go into a digital dollar. Um, so that's an idea because... You know, if if the digital dollar is a democratic idea with a capital D and the Republicans want basically no digital dollar, as they're still talking about, especially Tom Emmer, um, the way to counter that 
is to push a privately issued stablecoin. That's a good point. Um, so it can become a partisan issue. So the Republicans can say, we don't want a CBDC. The alternative is a privately issued stablecoin, stable which will do the exact same thing. Um, so there, there well could be that relationship. I haven't seen that. You'd have to dig pretty deep into what congressmen were thinking at that time to actually prove that link, but it makes a, a lot of sense. Congressmen actually think? They have people who do that for them. They're called staffers. Yes. <laughs> hacks. Anyway, um, here's uh, Mr. Gloy, Herr Gloy, if I may. Um, what is the problem that stable coins are trying to solve and why can't it be solved with within existing payment rails and institutions? Um, that's a good question. Um, part, part of it is, I think, of course, first you have something that will run on a DLT platform, which current e-money won't do easily. Um, Actually, Alexander says that. He says that uh, the need for stable coins today seems to exist only as a, uh, you know, as a stable leg of a DeFi AMM uh -huh. or something uh -huh. like that. But uh -huh. what is the use in the real world? That's, just, I mean, you know. Yeah, yeah. What you're seeing right now, the real use of it is in remittances, um, you know, like, like Stellar has this whole system to to use their stablecoin to run a remittance. Um, you can also you you know you use USDC and go wallet to wallet if you want to send money back home from the U.S. and then you don't have to jump through all the hoops of going through Western Union and this that and all these intermediary banks. So that's right now the big use case on a retail level for stable coins. Now the idea that you can use it and go to Starbucks and you know pay with USDC that'll be some distance away and again will there actually be a need for that? Why cuz I can use my phone to buy at Starbucks right now and I don't need a stable coin to do it. Um, so the retail case for stable coins I don't really see it right now, but something could come along. Um, if stable coin, if let's say a, a company starts issuing its own stable coin and tags a reward system to it, you know, use our stable coin, you get so many points, uh, just like a credit card. Um, back in 2020, I thought, the real use case for stable coins was for local private currencies. Uh, say a city like Pittsburgh wants to issue its own stable coin for a local currency just to be used in that area. And Pittsburgh could say, every time you use this stable coin, the money we make off of it will plow back into infrastructure within Pittsburgh where we'll build parks, we'll build libraries, something like that that would make a whole lot more sense than trying to have this global or transnational stable coin where you're competing with all the other networks, the e-money networks and credit cards and such. So I think it remains to be seen, but if you want to go back to the previous question, it's a good way to fend off st uh, CBDCs, at least in the oh. US. Okay, let me counter that a little bit. Okay. Um, the whole narrative that we have a separate payment rail now that is completely digital is actually false because each transaction uh, is 3%. Now, stable coins, I don't know whether they will take, uh, uh, you know, their pound of flesh from every transaction. No, but, no. but with the CBDC, I'm sure that the amount would be reduced to almost nothing. The, mm -hmm. uh, the narrative that people use is, I don't pay that, but I'm saying you do pay it because mm -hmm. the merchants have to pay it. 
And where do you think that merchant is making his money from? From you. Yeah. That means instead of a pizza costing $1, it will cost $125 or whatever. They'll also put in their own uh, you know, margin on top of that. Uh, yeah. And this is what's happening. But there is an element of credit in there, which, which uh, is anathema to crypto. Yeah. And um, anyway, so we will... Um, um, so you're arguing that it would cost less to use a stablecoin payment system. The well, fees would be I'm, lower. What I'm saying is uh, par. I mean, let's go back uh -huh. to par because par yeah. is the main challenge with stablecoins. And we know that. We know that because we have seen it break par in many, many, many uh, instances. The same thing, same way that uh, money market fronts broke par in 20, 2008. Mm -hmm. So uh, stress causes par to break for various reasons. I mean, we know why. Mm -hmm. uh, so by relying on a the highest form of money, this is this is the money view now. I mean, this mm -hmm. is Merlin's money view, which is that the central bank money is the highest form of money because they can issue it at will and nobody, you know, it yeah. cannot, you cannot cause a run on the central bank. That's right. it. I mean, you want uh, the money that no, no, everybody will take and every, you know, the only thing is that can happen is, of course, inflation or, you know, uh, reducing the value, purchasing value, but then that will reduce the purchasing value of stable coins because reduce the purchasing value of everything. Mm -hmm. um, and these... Uh, uh, Alexander Gloy is also asked that uh, is is the Fed uh, uh, worried about the senior age uh, uh, uh -huh. situation because because Tether or somebody else is now um, eating the Fed's lunch as as he puts <laughs> it. But I, I don't think he's there eating the Fed's lunch because this lunch is not even a smidgen of the amount of money that private banks issue and yeah. the senior age in the Fed's case is limited. I mean, they're not dependent on that, but I have heard talk that uh, small countries or, or countries that are poorer rely a lot on senior age. But um, this is uh, uh, AG saying that those 110 billion Invested in T bills would earn risk free 5.5 billion that would uh, otherwise accrue at the Fed and hence transfer to the Treasury, the tax mm -hmm. uh, My feeling about this is that the Fed is not trading treasuries uh, for anything other than monetary policy issues. And that's why they lose money when the interest rates go up. Um, mm -hmm. And they are not in this business to make money or to lose money. They are in the, in, you know, they are there. I mean, it, if it happens as a subplot, as a side uh, effect, mm -hmm. then, then they transfer it to the treasury. Okay, so here's another person. Um, if the use case is retail payment or remittance, what will be its degree edge for payment service providers that use? wholesale exchange rates from big financial institutions like MasterCard for large volume currency transactions. That is. I don't know. <laughs> banks, uh, are, uh, yeah. They are also working on deposit coins. Um, yeah. That's according yeah. to money and how is it different? You know. And uh, Visa, I think is very interested in stable coins. Um, see if they can get a piece of that action. Yes. Uh, so, <laughs> Who wouldn't be? <laughs> it's free money. Yeah. Once you set up the rails, uh, you know. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's basically a cash cow. Every transaction is being taxed at the rate of 3%. And when inflation goes up, that tax goes up. Uh, the actual amount of tax goes up. Um, you know, it's it's no wonder that Everybody's opposing this. Okay, 
coming back to the narrative coming back to the narrative part uh-huh. uh, which which you started out the thing with um the american uh feel you know culture is uh, says no l- l- small government right uh-huh. they're, they're not interested in getting involved in the global affairs although they're you know yeah they have been kick, uh, kicking and dragging they have been dragged into it because the world is sort of got uh one so in my mind the stable coin guys are just going back to the idea that private institutions do a better job than government institutions except when there's stress this is the, this is the question uh-huh. so lumis and gilibran um, says three things right one is uh, the fed controls it two they'll have fed uh, accounts and three is there's fdic like insurance Mm-hmm. accounts means uh, they have access to federal res- you know they can just deposit it in the reserve but this who will deposit in federal res- you know in the fed if they can make mo- more money by holding other instruments which mm-hmm. is what seems to be happening because they are getting huge uh and money play is asking do the upcoming U- us regulation permit cross border transactions using these payment stable coins that is of course the billion dollar question i don't think it's it's talked about in the bills uh, that's that's outside the concern of congress they're more concerned about the stability and uh and they would be concerned when it comes to you know bank secrecy act uh, kyc A- aml that stuff um that's that's where the rubber would hit the road about going outside the borders that's yeah but they're thinking you know if they can have if they can get that part and have a us issued stable coin it'll start to push it back against tether and other offshore stable coins well but any um us uh the uh tethered well i use the word tethered loosely um <laughs> with the <laughs> to the dollar is a global currency because yeah right away you're entering the realm of uh dollar supremacy and usd as a so that that's why i think uh, we should read a book a, a paper by um, mr uh, professor merling uh and others on on par which mm-hmm. compares stable coins with euro dollars mm-hmm. which is which is a key uh comparison because the way in which the market develops for a uh, euro dollar has got certain characteristics stable mm-hmm. coins don't have those characteristics and so how will you transit the boundary uh, you know in this case the geographical boundary but you could even say on chain versus off chain boundaries mm-hmm. all these different boundaries they pose they pose the biggest problem because to to maintain power it becomes you know there are mechanisms for doing that and uh Perry Merling's view is very uh useful because it's a money view which combines mm-hmm. both monetary view with finance view mm-hmm. and it has developed in New York which is the heart of both systems in this country for for a while and uh it's a it's an interesting take on the whole thing because you cannot keep them separate it's a systems view of uh, you know both these uh streams that are kept separate like in your case you're working for payment on uh, uh, by in the Kansas City Fed but the financialization aspect will also hit the stability of stablecoins anyway um 
So you go ahead and so here somebody is asking about SATP secure asset transfer protocol discussed in regulating stable coins. Um, if you don't have an answer for that, I have uh, something to offer. No, go ahead. Enlighten me there. Uh, there is a, uh, there is a um, presentation from, uh, I think the treasury department, there is a paper from the, uh, you know, eggheads. Okay. Uh, they talk about this interoperability issue because of course that is that is the key issue i mean in, in if you read on par mm -hmm. by uh, by merling it talks about that yeah but it also talks about the mechanisms that are involved in maintaining oh. par nobody ever thinks about them but they are there and they are very important because commercial bank money really is private money but mm -hmm. but we don't see a difference when we look at it between commercial bank money and cash, for example. Yeah. You know, we, we are able to uh, frictionlessly transform it. But there is a, uh, I can give you the reference. Uh, let me look uh, on my LinkedIn because my friend uh, Anjan Roy just posted it uh, to me, has shared it with me. Um, it says uh, it is called. Uh, well, it's a paper from 2022. It's called Fit for Purpose uh, uh, Payment System. Um, in, in okay. Uh, it's, it's not from Treasury Department. It's from, my bad, Federal Reserve. So they've already sort of thought about these things. Uh, but it's one thing to, uh, like Peter Drucker says, uh, culture will have strategy for breakfast. <laughs> so, so strategy and technology and te technical mm -hmm. uh, solutions have only so far to go because culture has to change. Either people have to feel threatened, like the global dollar system is being threatened, then you want alternatives. People may even agree to a global uh, to a U.S. Uh, uh, CBDC when they feel you know these things are happening. Anyway, uh, anyway, there was. I have to go go at ten then, Vipin. So yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So it's only let's ten have, minutes. Yeah, uh, let's have a question uh, yeah. or two. Yeah, can it be considered stablecoin if it's not backed by dollars, but the asset is environmental health or carbon removals? Not according to legislation coming out of the US Congress, but uh, uh, theoretically, I, I, I think those ideas have been around. But it has um, to have a peg, otherwise what is the stable part of it? Yeah, and of course you could argue algorithmic stable coins are, you know, are they actually stable coins, you know? Well, well, they are still pegged to the dollar. They, that's I mean, true, DAI, that's true. DAI, DAI, for example, which is a it's Ethereum stable coin is pegged to the dollar, even though it's backed by, you know, over collateralized yeah. uh, crypto, but yeah. over collateralized doesn't mean anything because crypto is so volatile that that over collateralization can disappear in an hour, mm -hmm. I mean, you know, uh, so where, 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 who makes the margin calls and wo what's going to happen and all that stuff still exists. And they run, runs on table. Yeah. Actually, Vitalik has a beautiful paper on the um, stability of stable coins. You know, he says, if it can survive a run, a full run, mm -hmm. uh, and what is a full run? It is not just the uh the you know that everything gets cashed out but it's the speed the speed is what is uh going to be a big problem because mm -hmm. one hand you have your reserves which have a different duration yep. than your stablecoin which has a duration of zero 
I mean, yeah. I can ask for it anytime. It's like a demand deposit, right? Yeah. So yeah. Um, this, these are uh, not questions that we have not confronted before, especially yeah. in traditional finance. So we have to uh, think about these deeply, even in crypto finance. It's not a different world. It is a slightly uh, different shade of the world. But, you know, same problems exist. And I think on par is a fabulous uh, contribution. And if people can read that, That'll give them a very good idea, not ab just about stable coins, but also about the euro dollar system. And it's 11 a.m. and it's time to <laughs> close the call. Unless you have something, uh, one more sentence or one more thing to talk about. Uh, no, if anybody wants to contact me, go through LinkedIn and message me. Not a problem. That's about it. And yes. Thanks for having me on again. I think it was three years ago I was last on. Yeah, but that was a totally different subject. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it remember. was. It was yeah. a, a, a physical. Crypto bank notes. Yes. Yeah. Well, um, anyway. Anyway. I think I think uh, we will have you on. Uh, you know, I, I have a feeling that these... Uh, debates are getting heated up more and more, and mm. you have to go. So I'll spare you uh, the details, but we will continue to talk on LinkedIn. All right. And uh, thank you all. Yeah, thanks everybody for showing up. Thank you. All right. See ya. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.